Cody Legibokov of Fort St. James, British Columbia, was your typical country boy. Wore hats, drove a truck, spent his free time fishing and hunting while knocking back a beer. To the people who knew him, no one suspected him to be capable of the crimes he would ultimately commit. But isn't that always what people say? And quite frankly, I don't think Cody deserves to have his life story told. It was a cold winter night on November 27, 2010. Constable Aaron Keller of the RCMP was traveling along a lonely section of Highway 27, north of the small community of Vanderhoof, British Columbia, when he noticed a truck pulling out from a rarely used logging road. This seemed odd to Keller, and under suspicion of poaching, he pulled the truck over onto the side of the highway and approached. Unbeknownst to Keller, this chance encounter would lead to bringing the career of one of Canada's youngest serial killers to an end. But, before we can get into the crime that ultimately resulted in Cody's arrest, we should go back to where it all began. On the early morning of October 27, 2009, an entire year before the events of November 27, the mutilated body of a woman was found just off the Otway Road Pit along the forested area of Moore's Meadow in Prince George, British Columbia. The body was the remains of 35-year-old Jill Stacy Suchenko, who was reported missing on October 22, 2009. A loving but troubled mother, she was described by her friends and family as a talented singer with a heart of gold. But Jill sadly fell victim to what so many people do, particularly in the Prince George area, a life of drug addiction and working in the sex trade. And I personally used to live in that area for many years and have known many people who fell prey to this lifestyle. It is not uncommon. We now jump ahead a year to October 9th, 2010. Police officer Kent McNeil and a partner were following up on a lead on a missing woman that took them to an area known as LC Gun Park, a well-known hiking location just east of Prince George, nearly a perfect diagonal line from where Jill's body was found in the gravel pit. While investigating the area, the officers noted the strong smell of decay in the air, but originally passed it off as garbage visibly glittered around the park. After searching the rest of LC Gun, Officer McNeil, with the help of a police dog and its handler, began to follow the smell of rot until they stumbled upon the corpse of 35-year-old Cynthia Mays. Just like Jill, Cynthia was well-loved, but had also fallen prey to the world of drug addiction and prostitution. Now, little details as to the cause of Jill's death were public, but Cynthia was a different story. Cynthia's wounds were horrific. She had been badly beaten to the point that her jaw and her cheekbone were broken. Her throat had been crushed, and a hole was found in her shoulder, which was later determined to have been caused by a picaroon, which is a form of an axe that was found in Cody's apartment with her blood on it. It was also determined by forensics that Cynthia had been dead for a month before she was found. Cody's third presumed victim was 23-year-old Natasha Lynn Montgomery, and I say presumed because to this day Natasha has been missing since August of 2010 and her remains have never been found, however her blood was found throughout Cody's apartment. She was a mother of two, originally from Quinnell, British Columbia, who unfortunately had a story similar to Jill and Cynthia's, drug addiction and prostitution. Now, Cody clearly had an M.O. and seemed to target sex workers who were capable of getting him cocaine and other drugs because he was addicted to that which makes the events of November 27, 2010, a bit of a weird outlier. As Constable Keller approached Cody's pickup that night, he immediately noticed something wasn't right. Cody not only had blood smeared on his face and his chin, but also on his legs and a pool of it at his feet on the driver's mat. Not something you want to see after pulling someone over who just drove out of a desolate logging road in the middle of the night. By this time, another officer had arrived at the scene, and they began searching Cody's truck. In it, they found both a multi-tool and a wrench covered in blood, and, unfortunately, a child's monkey backpack. Clearly, this was fishy. When asked about all the blood, Cody told the officers he had killed a deer and was stated as saying, and I quote, I'm a redneck, that's what we do for fun. None of this was adding up, but because Cody said that, the officers had a reason to detain him for suspicion of poaching, so he was arrested under the Canada Wildlife Act, and a conservation officer was called to the scene. The conservation officer headed up the road Cody's truck had come from, following the tire tracks in the snow expecting to come across the remains of a deer, but instead stumbled upon the mutilated body of 15-year-old Lauren Leslie. Lauren was from the small town of Vanderhoof, British Columbia, less than an hour away from Prince George. Now, I lived in Vanderhoof for most of my childhood, so this one hits home to me. Though legally blind in one eye, with only 50% vision in the other, she didn't let that stop her. She was a smart young kid, with dreams of becoming a forensic pathologist when she grew up, which is pretty insane for a 15-year-old. Like most kids her age, she spent a lot of time on social media, which just so happened to be where she met Cody, on the website Nextopia. Eerily, Cody's profile is still viewable on that site as of today. When Leslie's body was found, the scene was absolutely horrific. Her face had been so badly beaten that she was nearly unrecognizable. 
she'd been stabbed in the neck, and she had been sexually assaulted. Now we come to the trial, and oh boy was it ever a trial. Cody had every excuse in the book, and his story changed so many times that you'd swear the idiot was trying to write his own choose-your-own-adventure. Originally, he told investigators that he randomly stumbled upon Leslie's body on that logging road and that she'd killed herself. Now, how he would know that she killed herself if he just randomly stumbled across her body in the middle of nowhere? Hmm, doesn't add up. And when that didn't work, he changed things up and tried to convince them that he was with her, and the intention was to have sex, but all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Leslie just started attacking herself. She just snapped, screaming that she wanted to die. So Cody, being ever the gentleman, helped put her out of her misery. Not only is that stupid... But investigators quickly determined that Leslie had died via blows to the head that she could not have physically done to herself. Today, the Prince George man took the stand to defend himself against four first-degree murder charges. According to his lawyer, Lejabokov chose to testify to give his version of the story. The question of whether Cody Lejabokov would defend himself was answered within minutes. His defense lawyer, James Heller, called Lejabokov to the stand. Now, when it came to the murders of Cynthia, Jill, and Natasha, Cody admitted that he was involved, but that he didn't actually kill them. No, no. Instead, it was three drug dealers that the women owed money to. They did the killing. Cody just cleaned up the mess. He told the jury he refused to name the killers, only referring to them as X, Y, and Z. Cody claimed it was because snitches in prison don't fare well. But to be honest, I think it was just because Cody was too stupid to think up three names on the spot, and even if he had, he'd likely forget the names or mix up his stories. The jury thought so too, and Cody was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, which equates to 25 years in Canada at the Kent Institution, the only maximum security prison in British Columbia, also home to infamous serial killer Robert Picton. Guilty on all four counts. That makes Cody Allen Lechebokov Canada's youngest serial killer. Just now inside the Prince George Courthouse, Lechebokov didn't flinch when the verdict was read. Meantime, the gallery started, some members of the gallery started to cry. Some family, victims' family members were rubbing each other's backs when the verdict was read. Now, earlier today, the jury heard the cross-examination by the crown of Cody Lechebokov, and the deliberations just started yesterday. And now, they had several questions last night, and that's why court was called back into session. Now, going back to the origins of this case, Lejabokov was arrested back in 2010 on the highway on the way to Fort St. James. This verdict is now the final chapter in the tragic ending to these women's lives. However, in 2019, Cody was moved to the Warkworth Institution, a medium security prison in Ontario, which understandably did not make the victims' families very happy. Now I want to leave on one final note, just in case you didn't already think that Cody was subhuman pawn scum. After he was sentenced, as he was being led out of the courtroom, family and friends of Natasha pleaded for him to tell them where her body was so that they could bring her home. Cody didn't show a shred of emotion, and to this day has not revealed where her body is. A simple act of kindness, and he refuses to do it. You're already in prison on four counts of first degree murder. Just tell them where her body is so they can bring her home.